All right. We're ready to go. We are live here from Orange Beach, Alabama at the Wisdom Harbor Studios at the Wharf. This is the Blue Plate Special. I'm Andy Andrews, and we are glad you're here. This is going to be a special, special show today. And uh, okay, people are already piling in. There's Patricia Clapp. Um, how are you doing? You're from North Carolina. Sandy Stevenson watching from Virginia. Who? Angela Marshall. Hi, Joyce Cooper Ross. Uh, Christy, my sister, Don Moen. Hey, Don. Man, I'm glad you're here. Uh, you probably know our guest. So um, there's people from British Columbia and just uh, all over from Searcy, Arkansas, Harding University, where you guys ate your mascot. Yeah. Uh, I am very excited about this today. We're just going to roll right in. I want to uh, give you a, a heads up. Definitely click that notify button. Okay, that notification button. Uh, click the bell on it so that uh, wherever you are, if we go live, we, it'll come wake you up. It'll come get you out of a meeting, whatever. You, you will be notified that uh, we're on the air. And also, uh, if you haven't figured out the share part of Facebook, um, maybe we could get together and do like a little study time together. But listen, if you have ever shared one of these, uh, I, I, I don't even know what to call it, a show, a, a program, a, a, it's crazy, I, I know. Uh, but if you've never shared one, you want to share this one today. I am so excited about this. A, a few weeks ago, uh, and I'd heard a couple of people talking about uh, The Chosen, and and I, and I in the first couple of times I didn't even really know what they were talking about and, and then somebody asked me have you seen the chosen I said no and they said oh it's awesome you have to see it and I did I didn't really know nobody told me what it was about and then I get home uh, one evening and Polly said hey we got to watch the chosen I said I've been hearing about that what what is this there's Jason Crab Jason I am glad you're here you're gonna love this brother. Uh, Julie Enlow, she says she loves The Chosen. Well, you, you know, you're just ahead of me. But I, we get on this, and I am blown away. This is the story of uh, Jesus and the disciples that are, you know, and not disciples. At that point, they're, they're being chosen uh, to follow Jesus. And this, uh, this series, we watched the entire season one, and I was just blown away. But I got, I got to tell you. Oh, Siri, I didn't ask a question. She's, you know, and I've got it on mute. I've got this on mute, Matt. And this is like your generation's stuff. So here, you can have it. Um, I'm so sorry. I apologize for Siri. Um, what was I saying? Oh, here's what, here's what I was saying. Is that after the first episode, I'm just kind of kind of amazed and I'm, I'm, st I'm standing up there in our little sitting room where Polly and I've been watching it and the credits are rolling and I see a name and I went wait 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 stop 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 go back so Polly pauses it she goes back because I don't know how to work the remote and and there is there's it's the name Dallas Jenkins I said that's Jerry and Diana's kid and, of course, kid makes it sound like he's nine years old. But I know he's, he's, he's like an adult and done a lot of stuff. But I'm like, oh, my gosh. And then it's like he created it. He's one of the writers. He directed it. Well, I called Jerry. And I said, dude, you know, you have been holding back on me. You haven't told me about this. I was just amazed. And I said, I, I'm a bigger fan of your son now than I am of you. And I haven't even met your your son yet so we have him here with us and uh and i i really i i'm, I'm excited about this um let's let's get him on can you connect him dallas are you there i am here and i'm actually in my father's uh office right now and i hope the connection's okay but uh, colorado wi-fi isn't always the greatest but my family and i are actually visiting my parents for a couple of weeks just to get away from illinois for a bit and uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm proud to be here. Thanks for having me on. Man, I appreciate you taking the time uh, during this time. And it's a good thing that I can see you because I got to tell you, if if I wasn't seeing you, I would think your dad was playing a trick on me. You guys sound a lot alike. Yeah. 
Yeah, I uh, I, th- I think I look a little younger than he is at this point, but yes, oh, uh, we yeah. get that all the time. That uh, yeah. when I do radio interviews, people, I, I think we could get away with pulling some pranks on people if we really wanted to. That is awesome. Well, I, I've I've loved your mom and dad for such a long time, and I've heard so many things about about you and your family. Um, you know, I always tell I tell people when you and your when your dad and I are together somewhere and people talking to us, I, I will always say, you know, one of the greatest things in my career, one of the proudest things in my career is that uh, Jerry and I have combined to sell 100 million books. Of course, he's <laughs> sold 99 million of them, but we've combined to <laughs> sold 100 million. My good friend, Jerry Jenkins. Anyway, thank you so much for being here. Tell us, and I know we have a couple of clips, and uh, so I want everybody to see this, but you choose the time, okay, that you think that that these need to fit in. But I, but I, I, if you could tell everybody, what is the, the time period we're looking at in season one? So one of the things that kind of inspired The Chosen was I have seen almost every Jesus movie and miniseries ever made uh, you know, I've been a believer as long as I can remember. I was raised in a strong Christian home. So you see you see all the Jesus projects. And one of the things that I found to be somewhat lacking in most of them was because they went from Bible verse to Bible verse, miracle to miracle, uh, usually in a short amount of time, they didn't take the time to get into some of the context, the historical context, the cultural context, some of the backstories of these people. And some of that is because it's not in scripture. You don't see a lot of the history of some of who these people specifically were. So the the reason I'm saying that is to answer your question is season one of The Chosen actually takes its time. And when you first start watching episode one, you're going to see some of our main characters, uh, for lack of a better term, Simon Peter, his brother Andrew, um, Nicodemus, before they encounter Christ. Right. So like any good television show, which is what I, my wife and I love to binge watch television shows. And that's one of the reasons why I did this show was because you really fall in love with the people in the show and you get to follow them from season to season and, and you get to know who they are. And so what I was hoping to do was to introduce you to some of these people and get to know who they were, what they were struggling with and to and hopefully, and what we've been hearing from all over the world is that this has happened, is that the viewer can really identify with these people so that when totally. Jesus comes into their lives, you actually can think, huh, maybe the solution for their problems is the same for me. Whether you are a believer already, someone like Nicodemus, who was a, f- a follower of God uh, and, a, and a strong believer in the Old Testament, the Torah, or someone like Mary Magdalene, who was possessed by demons, Whatever, wherever you fall on that spectrum, uh, Jesus comes along and impacts your life. So I know this is a long answer to your question. But no, no, one, this is good. This is good. Of, well, it just covers essentially about a, just a couple of weeks. Um, and that's that's the beauty of a multi-season show. And why I did this show was because in, in, in eight episodes, we, we you I think we were able to explore more about the culture of that time, the setting, the backstory, getting to know these people, including Jesus, more than I think you can in just an hour and a half movie where you're trying to get from, you know, in, trying to cover the entire uh, crucifixion and resurrection and all that stuff. And so that's that's what I think uh, season one is, is just an attempt to really kind of set up who Jesus was, what this ministry was, and who the people were who followed him. And I'm man, I am really glad that this is doing well because I would I would be aggravated if I had to figure out a way to fund the entire season two just so I could see it. Um, but you guys, this has uh, been seen by how many millions of people now? I know you're in every country of the world. It's all been translated. But how many people? How many views have you had yet on this season? Well, we just passed thirty million views. Uh, a couple days ago. Uh, so that probably means about somewhere around 10 million people. I mean, the the app, which we can talk about in a minute, but the, the we, we've done this kind of outside of the system. So you're not going to find The Chosen on Netflix or a major network. We kind of did it ourselves and my distribution partners invented this technology. So where when you download The Chosen to your phone, you can literally connect it to your streaming devices free and easy. Yeah, and on, um, on your big screen that, TVs, everything. Yeah, 
Yeah, you just, whatever streaming device you have, Roku, Fire Stick, Apple TV, it connects free and easy, no subscription fees whatsoever. So our app has been downloaded. I mean, the numbers are going up every day, but it's somewhere in the neighborhood of five to six million downloads since the beginning of the year. And since the quarantine, it's gone up crazy. I mean, the the uh, right. the, the downloads have just gone crazy because I think people have time to watch right now and are really seeking something life-giving. So the word's been spreading like crazy just in the last month and a half or so. So it's tough to know exactly how many people because there's also been group screenings back in last year sure. and early this year, but sure. it's been it's been going a little crazy and it's starting to explode in countries like Brazil and the Philippines right now. So it's been a it's been a crazy crazy ride uh, this year and it's been it's been fun to be be part of what God is doing. Dana Hebbard says that the tech with the app is so awesome. Haley Cooper says it's her favorite show of all time. Thank you, Dallas, for creating this. Uh, Pat Kraft has watched the first season. Looking forward. We've got people just, man, I, I can't even keep up with it, Dallas. Um, but I, I do want to apologize for not wearing a, a, a get ready for different T-shirt. Mine is on order, though. It's on the way. I got an against the current and uh, I get ready yeah. for different. Um, I, I, I'm curious about the music because the music, man, you, you know, you do that little teaser there at the first and then that music. Who who did that? And the, the graphics of that against the current. I just I just love that. Yeah, the opening credits are in many ways. We consider them to be an announcement as to, to that this show is going to be a little different. Um, and a lot of people say it felt like the opening credits make it feel like it's a kind of show you'd see on, on Netflix or AMC or HBO or something like that. Uh, I was just really interested in several things. Number one, the graphics themselves are inspired by, and you may, you may remember this, uh, uh, in all love and humility, I say to you, you're in the older generation. So you might yeah. uh, remember back in the day when, when Hitchcock movies, those opening credits were done by the great designer Sal, Saul Bass. Um, right. And th that was kind of the inspiration, that kind of graphic design. And what we show is a bunch of fish, and this is, this is what inspired my shirt, a bunch of gray fish are going in one direction, all just kind of with the current, with the flow, they're gray. And then one teal fish comes to go in the other direction. And then one by one, certain fish change color, change to teal and start following this one fish. And at the end, there's a circle of fish like my shirt, and the 13 teal fish are going in the opposite direction. Um, and that was to me a statement about what the show is, about, about during that they came, Jesus came during this time when both the religious leaders, the, the people, everyone was just kind of going in one direction and Jesus kind of came and, and, and upset the apple cart a little bit and, and, and caused people to go against the current. Now the music itself is also very different. Uh, it was composed and written by Dan Hasseltine, the lead singer of Jars of Clay. Uh, he's a close friend of mine and Jars of Clay inspired me over 20 years ago when their first album came out, it was, you know, hopefully similar to The Chosen, very different. It was, I remember it was one of the first albums I'd heard that was a strong Christian album where I felt like, wow, this isn't just a copycat of something else. This is really fresh and I can recommend this to all of my friends. And right. uh, he and I got to know each other, he, he's brilliant. So the music, it's, it's kind of a, a combination of Southern gospel meets slave spirituals meets Middle Eastern drone. Uh, it's we were trying to capture the the oppression mixed with hope that you defines did. a lot of the slave miracles of the turn of the century, um, which is similar to what the Jews were experiencing with the Romans. And so the lyrics of the song um, are also kind of a call to action. That opening credit song where it says, um, come, come walk on the water with us. I got no trouble with the mess that you've been. Um, it was just really the lyrically and musically and graphically a call to action. This show is a little different, and the message uh, is is something that I think can reach people of all stripes. And that's kind of Me what too. we're trying to do, just with the open. A, a lot of people are commenting now on the music. Jay Muller, uh, yes, the music is awesome. Mark Lowry just joined us. Uh, Mark, if you haven't seen the show, oh, I'm a big Mark gotta, Lowry fan. I, I, yeah, that's awesome. He he's a great guy, and I'm sure he's sharing this to his whole bunch and. And um, well, can I say something and, real quick? Let me say something absolutely. real quick about Mark Lowry. Um, absolutely, because because I think this because even if just Mark's, uh, even just if Mark when is, you when you're when you're talking about Mark the Dallas, just don't cuss because most of us do. So 
Where are we talking about, Mark? <laughs> yeah, I'll try to avoid that. But <laughs> what um, you got? But yeah, it, if Mark is is listening or not, I, I actually just watched about two weeks ago a clip of Mark Lowry telling the story of Mary, the mother of Jesus, and what it must have been like uh, to give birth to, to to the Son of God, and 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 he's such a brilliant storyteller. And at that time. I was writing episode three of season two. And in that episode, Mary talks about the birth of Christ and, and gives some of that context. And Mark is such a brilliant storyteller. And um, I think what he does when he tells that story, and I think what storytellers do throughout history, and I think what you do, you're a storyteller as well, is we're trying to put you in that moment and, and try to take you there. And what I think The Chosen has been able to do from at least what people are telling me is it puts you there. And um, I think I was inspired a little bit by what Mark had said, but wow. that concept of more than just words on the page when you read, because uh, the Bible wasn't, the, the gospels weren't intended to, to, to be like a TV show. They were essentially Jesus's greatest hits for the purpose of telling you that he was the son of God. Totally and making agree. that case. And so what I think we're trying to do with the show, and I think what a good pastor will do when he's reading scripture and then takes you to the context of it, what a guy like Mark Lowry is doing is we're trying to get you there. And what what, what the show is doing is, is I, I want you to be able to smell the smells and see the dust and fe- realize that this, that this context that Jesus came in was not like a flanograph Sunday school lesson where he was wearing white and blue and he just always had a smile on his face and everyone was just walking along and smiling when they saw the precious Jesus. It was a dark, difficult, challenging time, not only for the, for the area, but for the people themselves. And Simon Peter and Mary Magdalene and Nicodemus and, and uh, Matthew, the tax collector, the people that we chose to be our main characters were having difficult, challenging circumstances, both personally and uh, on a larger human scale. And so anyway, just when you brought up Mark, it just reminded me of, of that. Cause I just, I just saw him a couple of weeks ago talking about the birth of well, Christ. Well, Mark, Mark is watching and I, I am, I, I'm thrilled for Mark. I mean, because I'm telling you, man, uh, you know, Dallas, this whole thing is just so brilliant to, uh, to have had Mark inspire a piece of it. That just makes me so proud for Mark. Um, I, I've got so many questions, and people are just like rolling through. I, I can't catch everybody. I, I tend to go after the show and look and, and answer some. I do want to say uh, right now, though, that because some people are asking about the shirts, and the shirts are at uh, thechosenmerchandise.com. Is that correct? Thechosenmerch.com. And in fact, if there's any chosen fans in the chat, they're saying something about the jingle. Uh, when I was when I do live streams, I kind of spontaneously start singing www.thechosenmerch.com. I apologize because if that thing starts getting in your head like it gets in mine, it's going to drive you crazy. But it's thechosenmerch.com. That's where you get this shirt. And uh, we got a few other things there. I don't I don't want to come on and start being. A no, pitching, but that's OK. But, my gear. but if it does get into your head, it, the the only thing to do is just go buy another shirt. So um I mean, because because yes. yes. hey, we're you know, it's an investment in this project, an investment in getting this well, yes. to your friends. And I, w- I would like to say right now as well. I don't often say this, like right in the middle of one of these, but if you it, you can keep watching and share this show to your page, and um, and share this to your friends, and so it, you know, just keep watching. But uh, just another, just a little. Uh, I think because I, I, I'm just I'm loving hearing this. Dallas, is there is there a scene that uh, I mean, eight episodes just and by the way, that's the only thing that made me mad about the whole thing, because I didn't know how many episodes it was. I was just like, we're digging into it every night. We're going to watch more. We're going to I, I mean, it was just awesome. And when <clears throat> the the final scene, which I want to ask you something about that final scene later, but when. When it ran, and I stood up and I said, "Wow!" And Polly said, "Yeah, that's that's it." And I was like, "What? What?" I mean, I just I just wanted to go find you right then. I mean, it's, it it was just great. But is there a, is there a scene in in that season one that 
that is special to you because maybe it, it, it was hard to do, harder to do than you thought? It, it yeah. looked like you wanted what? Yeah, that's a great question. And it, it's something, uh, you know, we, we, we talked very briefly before uh, we got on the air here. And, um, you know, I think we've talked about episode four is, is probably at the time was my favorite episode. Episode seven now has probably gone up to number one, but uh, which we'll talk about later. But uh, I, we, we do have a clip um, from, from episode four, which is when we've spent a couple episodes getting to know Simon Peter and getting to know who he was. And when you can, when you look in the gospels and you can see what Simon Peter was like after he met Jesus and after Jesus called him to follow him. And even though he had, uh, he had been chosen by, by Christ to follow him and to be one of his leaders. I mean, probably the most famous disciple. Um, and even after he knew Jesus, he was all over the place. I mean, Jesus at one point called him Satan. And then on another point called him the rock on which he was going to build his church. This guy was all over right. the place. But, um, and I think we can, a lot of us can identify with him. But that moment when Jesus calls Peter to follow him, uh, and it comes on the heels of this tremendous miracle that's one of the famous stories of the Gospels, where the, the, the catch of fish, um, we really wanted to earn that moment. We wanted to show you what, what may have led up to that moment. Now, we don't know the actual facts of everything, but we can make plausible scenarios about how oppressed they were with the taxes. So this right. scene uh, that I want to show you is from episode four, and we have been with Simon all night long. We know that he was fishing all night desperate because uh, this was his livelihood. And uh, we've got Matthew, the tax collector, who is following him because he owes major taxes to Rome. And so Matthew has been assigned by the Romans to follow Simon and figure out what he's doing, why he's doing what he's doing, why he's delinquent on his taxes, if he's going to come through. Um, and Simon's been up all night. And so when uh, Jesus uh, has been preaching and uh, using Simon's boat to preach, this is uh, what we're about to show you is kind of what happens next. Put that down for a catch. A little farther out. Uh, I don't have a quarrel with you, teacher. But we've been doing this all night. Nothing. All right. That's your word. Wow. I mean, I just, golly. So, well, what's funny about that scene, beyond just the content itself, which I which I love, and it was very moving, uh, just even for me to watch it, um, I, I love watching it each time, but three days before we filmed that scene, and I'm not exaggerating when I tell you this, uh, well, I'll say four days, four days before we filmed that scene, because it was Thanksgiving, and we were going to be filming that scene on Monday, we didn't have a boat, we didn't have fish, and we didn't have a lake. Um, and that kind of defines how this project has gone from day one is, you know, I, I, right now it's, it's, it's proving to be successful, for lack of a better term, and it's, it's doing well uh, so far. But 
that each day has been what we call the manna program. Uh, my wife came up with this term, the manna program, which is when God, you know, gave manna to the Israelites, he gave them only enough for that day. And he even said, if you try to store up more manna for the future, I'm going to make it rot. He wanted them each morning to come to him, you know, hands outstretched for right. his daily right. provision. And that's what this show has been like. And so I had been taught that lesson for a year and a half leading up to Thanksgiving. And because of that, I wasn't all that stressed out. But we do, we have a video on our YouTube channel and on our Facebook page called The Miracle of the Miracle of the Fish, because yeah. um, those fish that you're seeing in that scene are, are, are were not there in the water. They, they were created all on, you know, in post-production with, with uh, visual effects because every single attempt that we made to get fish that we could use in that scene fell through until four days before we, all of our options ran out. We had no fish. And, and even, even boat, your guy uh, didn't really know uh, how he was going to do it. The right? visual effects guy, well, you know, the visual effects guy, when, when, you know, when I was looking for confidence that, that the visual effects could work, he was like, yeah, I think so. And, yeah, and thank that, you. what we did use, on the, yeah, exactly. On the day when we were filming, we had this big green tarp that was filled with water balloons so that it would be heavy and would would would, would sink. But the green, you know, is like our own green screen. A green screen. And we referred yeah. to it as, the, yeah, the the green burrito was what we used to, <laughs> the term we used for it. And it was it was in an actual net. And so when they were lifting that that heavy heavy thing into the boat. That was real. All that strain, all of their pushing, all that, and as well as their celebration when they got into the boat, that was real too because it was so difficult. But um, when when I'm done filming that scene, because uh, the reason the lake we didn't have a lake at the time was because the lake had flooded, and so there was no there was no beach. But it kept going down just in time so that by the day the day we were ready to shoot, it was at the perfect level. The boat. The, the, the paint on the boat was still drying that morning when we filmed because they'd been building it for a month. And uh, it was it was crazy. And so when we finished filming, we're like, we think that went well. The acting was great. The boat looked great. The water looked great. I hope the fish come through. But I was in this place where, um, you know, God had taken me to this place for the last year and a half of just realizing it's not my job to feed the 5,000. It's only to provide the loaves and fish which is kind of become a famous story in chosen in the chosen world. Right. And, uh, and so I just trusted, I had no choice. I literally had no choice, but to just trust each day with my hands outstretched that this was going to work. And uh, it became one of the most talked about scenes in the show. And the guy who did the visual effects kind of at the last minute as well, kind of came up with this solution that he, he believes God gave him at the last minute to make it look good and to make it work. And uh, we get people all the time who said they had no idea it was, you know, the the, the backstory, and it felt like a, a great scene, you know. So it was, you know, it's you, just how you this whole grew up. Worked well. You grew up in the middle of the country, and and so there is a little bitty tiny thing about that scene that I'm, you know, you directed the whole thing, and I'm sure you know this. But so I'm just affirming that there is a little bitty tiny thing in there that lends so much reality to to the scene and, and so much surprise you know here on the gulf coast a lot of people we pull shrimp trawls and they're they're big nets that pull along the bottom to catch shrimp and there's not anybody here or you know who has dragged a shrimp trawl who hasn't hung up at at one point or another you drug it over some some thing down there and and what it does to the boat it's kind of scary you know because the boat you know you're towing along and all of a sudden one of those ropes hangs and it's like pow and that boat jerks and i when you know when simon is standing there and it's just like yeah okay we did it you know so come on let's get in we're tired and that boat goes pow and i mean those fish hit that net it's just such a it's such a killer moment for me. Yeah, and I think that's the kind of stuff that w that we look for, those little details that I think right. make those moments even more emotionally and spiritually p impactful because – which would be – which I think would be surprising to think about because you'd think, well, the point of the scene is that Jesus does this big miracle. 
Yeah, and that's great. And when I see it prefer, per, portrayed in previous Jesus movies, it's always nice to see. And when you read it in the scriptures, it's interesting. But when you add those little details, and even just the, the exchange between Jesus and Simon, we get as many comments about that little look that Simon gives like, I yeah. agree. Like, see, oh, you know, I, I knew this wouldn't work. And Jesus, instead of getting frustrated at him or saying, just wait or whatever, he just kind of gives him a little look back like, yeah, you'll see. And then right then and there, as we're focused on Simon, the boat just tips over. And it's just one of those visual things that, that for me, I thought this, again, for, for me as someone who believes this story and who loves Christ and loves this story, this these little details help, I think, enhance the your experience with it and make the moment of Jesus calling Simon, which comes, of course, later, a few minutes after this moment that we just right. watched, that much more impactful. Because you see Simon, you, you, I think you can identify and go, yeah, that's me. I, I, I sometimes have been challenging people around me going, yeah, I don't think this is going to work. And and uh, let's try, so, let's do something, let's give up or let's do something different. And I think those are the moments when God sometimes likes to to show off a little bit and right. and, and and this whole project has been every time that I have tried something myself and poured myself into something that I thought was going to work perfectly and it didn't work, at the last minute, something would come along that was so much better than I would have done myself. And it's been so comforting to know that this project is in God's hands and not my own because it's so much better than I am. Isn't that amazing? Matt Balher is with us, Damon Reese. Uh, Sylvia Garing, uh, the comments are pouring in so fast, Dallas, I can't even tell you. The, people are just, people loved that scene. Uh, and and we will, at, at the end, uh, Dallas, you have you may have to remind me, but let's remember to uh, uh, tell people about the app again. You know, and I was, Damon, I'm just going to blow your cover here. I was talking to Damon earlier this morning, and he said, I haven't seen it. He said, but I, I want to see it. Is it, it seems like it might be hard to, you know, to find, and I said, Damon, 30 million people have found it. I'm sure you can. You know, so, so we'll <laughs> tell you about the app in a little bit. By the way, tomorrow we are going to do a blue plate special tomorrow. And uh, we're gonna, and our topic is going to be Father's Day. We're going to have a, a, a preparation for Father's Day tomorrow. We're going to have some stories. We're going to have some guests. It's going to be a lot of fun. Um, Dallas, I, I am, uh, I'm curious about, like, I think Simon was cast so well. I mean, he was cast so well, I don't even want to know who he is. And I know as an actor, it's like he's got to be going, great, thank you. Uh, but golly, I, I, I have been a person that I've never wanted to read a book after I saw the movie. You know, I remember, I remember reading uh, The Green Mile, and, um, and Tom Hanks was on the cover. The movie was already out, and it took something away from the book for me because I'm like the whole time I'm reading about this, it's Tom Hanks, you know, and so I did. It did cross my mind while we were watching the the Chosen. It did cross my mind. I wonder how knowing, you know, seeing these guys, you know, Polly made my wife made the comment at one point. She said, "Boy, I'm not sure everybody back then was this decent looking." You know, and, and, I, and I, I thought, yeah, I never thought of that. But I, but I wondered how it was going to affect my reading the Bible. And I'm going to tell you something. I totally shocked, but it has enhanced my reading of the gospel so much. I, I, I never pictured these people like this, because it. it but when I think about it, I think you have. You have nailed it. I don't know why. I've always thought of Peter as some like seventy year old guy, but but all these guys are young, right? Yeah. Well, that's what we uncovered in our research, and I I talked to a few. I mean, I, the research for, for in some of these stories and some for some of these uh, concepts is all over the place. But it seemed most likely that the disciples were actually quite young, uh, probably late teens. Now we know Simon Peter was the oldest. Uh, or, or because he was married. He was probably the only one who was married. We know he was married because they mentioned his mother-in-law uh, and the healing of his mother-in-law, which we cover in, in, near the end of the season. But um, the that, that was that that detail has been really interesting for people when they watch is is knowing when you when you really get to know these people and you get to know 
what their circumstances were, it does enhance your scripture reading. Uh, now, yes, of course, that can. It, we've had a few people say it while they're reading the Bible, they start picturing some of these uh, characters from the show. And, uh, and, and you could look at that in, as a good or bad thing. I think for the most part, what we're hearing from people all over the world every day is what you just said. I, they, they, they'll tell us, I've never read the Bible more than I have since I've watched this show. And my experience in reading the Gospels has been so enriched because when we get to know the backstory and the context, it makes those moments that much more powerful. Uh, and and I think even in, in uh, you know, we, we if you want, we can show this clip as well from John chapter 3 because John chapter 3 is one of the most, it, well, probably is the most famous chapter in the Bible. But when you Please know do. some and, of the backstory. And, yeah, and set this up about Nicodemus and what's going on. Yeah. So, um in John chapter three, in John three sixteen, of course, is the Bible verse that you see on, at the football games all the time. Um, and all we know is Nicodemus <laughs> met Jesus at night. And when we are introduced to Nicodemus later in the Gospel of John, it mentions that he. It specifically says Nicodemus, who had met with Jesus under cover of night. So you know that he was doing it privately. Um, he right. was a Pharisee. Uh, which, which meant that at the time, most of the Pharisees found Jesus to be a blasphemous um, a danger to their whole religious system. And not even just from a selfish standpoint, they genuinely believed that he was blaspheming uh, their, their beliefs and the beliefs of the people. And so uh, we spend several episodes in season one leading up to this moment, getting you to, 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 to know Nicodemus and what would have caused him to potentially believe in Jesus. And so we take the time to give you the backstory, uh, to give you a plausible idea of what it would have been like so that when Jesus and Nicodemus finally meet and we get to the most famous moment in the Bible, there's an emotional connection to it as well. So I think as you watch this clip, um, it's, it's, it, it's just an excerpt from the scene. The scene itself is actually seven or eight minutes. But this clip, I think when you watch the most famous verse in the Bible, it feels a little bit more emotional than just seeing it out, completely out of context. Do you remember when the children of Israel complained against God and against Moses in the wilderness of Paran? Yes. They wanted to return to Egypt and they cursed the manna that God sent them. And then? They were bitten by serpents and they were dying. But? But God made a way for them to be healed. Moses lifted the bronze serpent in the desert and people only needed to look at it. So will the Son of Man be lifted up so that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. Our people are not dying from snake bites. They're dying from taxation and oppression. I'm sorry to disappoint you, but I did not come to deliver the people from Rome. Then from what? From sin, from spiritual death. God loves the world in this way, that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Well, your dad is watching from the other room, by the way. He says, you're doing really good. So, <laughs> well, good. man, I mean, the, the, that, that, I'm that scene, computer, so he's probably wanting me to get off. That scene and and I mean, the crickets in the background and that. I mean, I'm just blown away. Well, I think those scenes again. We I remember when we were filming it, um, the actor who plays Nicodemus is extraordinary. His name is Eric Avari. He's been in the business for decades. Um, and what's so interesting about that scene is that. We knew this was big. We knew this was important. This was what so many viewers had been waiting for in the first six episodes. And when you when you follow Nicodemus's journey to Jesus and what gets him to that place where he's actually believing, um, it's it's it really is extraordinary. But uh, Eric Avari, again, the actor who played uh, Nicodemus, talked about this. Uh, that scene was uh, truly truly emotional for him, and he wasn't sure why. I think I had an idea why because I think he was. I think when when whenever you're fa even when when you're in the context of a scene in a movie or a show you're when you're facing um words that are from scripture uh right. it, can, it can really uh, God can use it to pierce your heart in an extraordinary way 
But uh, what comes before that scene or the excerpt that we just showed you and what comes afterwards, right? As Nicodemus reacts to what Jesus told him, uh, it's, it's, uh, it, it was truly life altering for all of us. But I think one of the things I wanted to point out is at the beginning of that scene, Jesus, or that excerpt that I showed you, Jesus is talking about what happened with Moses in the desert. Right. And that's something that we sometimes gloss over when we're reading John chapter three. So at the beginning of episode seven, we show you a flashback to Moses and Joshua in the desert and Moses is building that serpent and they're working through. Joshua doesn't understand why in the world Moses would be making this, this bronze serpent that would cause people to just be healed just from looking at it. It was crazy. And, and, and Joshua thought it was crazy. And Moses didn't know what God exactly what God was doing. But when you see those moments, again, in context, it can really connect you and see that through line in scripture and that Jesus was coming to to kind of fulfill, not kind of, definitely fulfill a lot of the things that had happened in the Old Testament. And so when you can introduce that and, and clarify it in, in the form of a show like this, it really does bring the Gospels to life. Man, I've got, I know we're running out of time, but I have, uh, I have a, 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 I have a question, a general question. I have a question about a character and then I have a comment, and then I'll let you go. My question, the general question is, I'm curious if you, have you had any pushback about this, just about what you put in, what you didn't put in? I, I mean, just knowing people, Yeah. my guess is that you have. Yeah, for sure. Um, I don't really, and I, I, I hope you take this the right way, I don't really well, care. Well, wait, 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 stop. Um, Dallas, Dallas, Dallas. Just Kathy Hill has just, she just right here said, uh, I love the plausible backstories. So I think that might lead you right into your answer. Keep going. Yeah. So it's funny. People will, we'll get, we'll get comments uh, frequently. I mean, it's the minority. Most people who've seen the show have been really uh, positive, but we get the occasional people who are just, they don't want to see anything that's not directly from scripture. Um, and so when they see any clips from the show or they, or they, you know, they, I mean, even in the clip you just saw, some of it's from scripture, but there's other lines that we, we added and, uh, there are people just uncomfortable with that. And what's funny is they'll make a comment about it. Like you shouldn't do this and, and, and you shouldn't have done that. And I hope in future seasons, you just stick to scripture. And I, what, what's kind of funny about it is I kind of want to say, look, that that train left the station a while ago. We wouldn't have done this show if we hadn't have already considered this. Um, th right. th that decision has been made. I, I I believe that for the most part, the reason that people have been okay with it, and have and and people even conservative Bible scholars have loved the show, even though a good chunk of the show is not based strict, strictly from scripture, uh, from it's from history or from artistic imagination is because it's coming from someone in myself who genuinely loves scripture. I have no right. desire to rewrite it. I have no desire to uh, detract from the intention and character you're, of scripture. You're not distorting it? Jesus. No, I'm and we're not the Bible. I mean, that's a big thing to remember. Your Bible has not changed since The Chosen came out. We are not changing scripture or adding to it because we're not scripture. We are a show that is based on scripture, based on history, based on plausible scenarios that we believe could have happened. And uh, it should not be a replacement for scripture. This show is not scripture. Jonathan Rumi, who plays Jesus, is not Jesus. And so... Now, even that, though, to, even though I will clear. tell you, it, you know, yeah, okay, he's not Jesus, but I will just tell you, if I get on an airplane with that actor one day, I'm going to freak out. I'm just telling you. So go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Well, and, and, and it is, but I think the reason the portrayal is so strong and why people say this feels like the Jesus that I've known my whole life, but I've never actually seen on screen right. is right. because we genuinely love Jesus. We love the gospels. We are trying to uh, honor the intentions and character of Jesus and the Gospels, even in those moments that aren't strictly from the Gospels. And, you know, I, I always wonder, I, I, when people say something like that, and I, I don't mean to keep you on this topic, but when people say things like that, it just like, it, it gets my goat, you know, because I always think, okay, so the red letters in the Bible, Jesus said them, but do you think he never said anything else? I mean, do you think he never right. ever said pass the salt or something? Right. You know, I right. I mean, good grief. 
Like, because there is one part right. of the Bible I know that, uh, or one thing that Jesus said that's not included in the Bible, and you may consider this for future seasons, uh, and that is uh, at, at the Last Supper when Jesus said, everybody who wants to be in the picture needs to get on this side of the table. <laughs> right. Yeah, that's... Uh, I, I have a feeling that wasn't actually the the exact words that he used, but, but probably but, not. But but it's for sure made, made for a fun story for the Last Supper. Oh my gosh! So here's here's a, the question about the character that I have. I, I I was fascinated by Matthew, just the choice that uh, Matthew's like OCD. I mean, he's like. I just can you explain yeah. that a little bit just for me? I because I know that people who haven't seen it yet. I, but I was just, I was just fascinated because yeah. it was, these were people, man. It was just, it's not Jesus and the twelve Jesuses, you know. I mean, these were people, right. and so that. But your casting yeah, of Matthew fascinated me. Yeah, um, and I and I unfortunately want to say I I, I will have to go after this question because I've gotcha. I, I have another meeting that I had to attend, so so I apologize. But um, no but yeah, Matthew is um, you just said it really well when you said it's uh, it makes him a person. Uh, I had a friend of mine say typically in Jesus projects there are three disciples. There's Simon Peter because he's the famous one. There's Judas because he's the one who betrayed Jesus. That's a famous story. And then the other ten disciples are all one. Uh, they yeah. all look the same. They talk the same. Uh, they don't have distinct human human characteristics. Uh, so when we were wanting to do that for all of the disciples in this show, Matthew was once someone who stood out uh, because he tax collectors were so hated at that time. And uh, we thought that was really interesting of what would happen when Jesus calls a tax collector to join this team. What would the inner circle think of that? So we thought that was interesting. So when we were plotting out who he was and what his characteristics were, like we do whenever we write, and we go, okay, Matthew, he was a numbers guy because um, he was a tax collector and an auditor. He was a facts guy, F-A-C-T-S, meaning he, his first chapter of his, of his book is just nothing but a genealogy. And he chose a profession that made him a social outcast. And I thought, what if we gave a, uh, Matthew Asperger syndrome? What if, what, you know, because it's, uh, you know, uh, there's nothing in scripture about that, but of course, back then they didn't have any of those diagnoses. Right. So it may not be a fact. It's, it, I, we believed it was plausible. I have a lot of familiarity with it. My daughter is autistic. Um, I know I, I've done a lot of work in the special needs community. I know the autism community and, and that and that diagnosis extremely well. And so we were able to write a plausible uh, scenario about not only Matthew, but what it would look like. And so we we get more comments probably about Matthew than any other character. Uh, parents of people on the spectrum who are appreciative of it, um, teenagers, uh, adults, even young children who just really connect with him uh, because not, whether even if they don't have autism or aren't on the Asperger's uh, uh, spectrum, they can identify with maybe being an outcast, being being on the outside, and 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 yet Jesus seeing that and recognizing that and calling you anyway, calling you to be part of His team even in the midst of your struggles, uh, and and exploring in future seasons how Matthew. Uh, come make sense of what Jesus has done by calling him and how the other disciples make sense of having this enemy on their team is uh, going to be one of the things that we're really exploring in season right. two. Uh, so we are, you know, season, episodes one through four have been written. Uh, we are currently looking for our location and, and uh, developing it. And so I promise you, we are, we are uh, on our way towards season two. Okay. Well, listen, you go, uh, we'll, you and I will talk later. Go. Thank you for being here. I'm going to make sure everybody knows uh, about the app. We'll post that. But Dallas, thank you for being here. We're, and you guys stay right where you are. We're going to talk a few more minutes. Dallas, go thank your family for us. Tell your dad and mom hi. Thank you so much for having me on. I, I love it. Okay, buddy. Take care. You guys, I hope you have enjoyed that as much as I enjoyed that. Matt, can we, can we post a, a link to the app? so that everybody will know how to how to get that and and truly you can figure that out okay this is you know th like i told damon 30 million people have figured it out so i'm sure that you can too um yeah we were polly and i were fascinated by the matthew character because it was like i mean he's so clearly you know different and you know dallas's explanation of that was awesome you know the 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 one thing 
and I'm going to ask him at some point this, uh, and we've already talked. He's he's wanting to do the uh, the podcast at some point because we're you know in several weeks we're going to be doing the podcast, doing the professional notice, or that will be interviews, and they will be live, and then we'll post them, and so you can see them live if you want to, but. Uh, that's a longer format, and so uh, one of the things that I want to ask him about, and I want you to watch for when you watch this, and it, it may probably in it would probably be in episode three, I guess. I don't don't quote me on that, but uh, there is a point, you know, where uh, where Jesus has healed Mary Magdalene, and now. Uh, the G- big Jewish holiday is happening. It's happening in the rich houses. It's happening in the, and, and then uh, Mary Magdalene's house, and she is hosting her first one. And so she's going to read the things. And when, when Jesus shows up at her house, she doesn't, I kind of know what to do. And so as they, as they sit down, there is a guy there, and uh, his wife is blind. And uh, the guy is, he is a guy that all of us know. I mean, I'm just telling you, we all have friends like this guy. He's funny. He's boisterous. He uh, kind of, you know, gets ahead of himself. He'll say things. He, he doesn't care what anybody thinks. And, and then a lot of times he goes over the line and people go, oh, my gosh. And, and so there's this moment where, you know, Mary Magdalene has encountered Jesus and been healed, and she doesn't know his name. And so as they're all coming in, into the house and they're sitting down at the table, she says, oh, I'm sorry, I don't know your name. And he says, I'm Jesus of Nazareth. And the guy over here goes, ah, well, apparently something good can come from Nazareth. <laughs> Well, everybody at the table's like, <gasps> and he's like, what, what? And Jesus does this. Jesus goes, winks. It is such a great moment. It's like the wink. I just, you know, that's the, that's the Jesus I have known, right? I, I just, uh, I thought that was just a, a fabulous moment. You guys, um, there are so many things to talk about, about the show, and we will again, okay? Uh, but definitely, definitely watch the, the uh, link to the, to the app is posted, and we appreciate you being here with us. Tomorrow, we are going to do a Getting Ready for Father's Day episode of the Blue Plate Special. And this is going to be fun. If you if you are you know needing to get ready, needing some ideas, needing some uh, stories to tell, some hints to drop, um, some traditions to observe, we're going to talk about Father's Day. You know, this year Mother's Day is passed, and we are not going to forget the dads. Okay, so that's tomorrow, twelve fifteen Central Time, here. Thank you guys so much. Um, I'm going to go on, watch this again, uh, touch base with some of you, but I, I've seen so many names that I recognize. I appreciate you being here with us. Have a great rest of your day. Bye-bye. <laughs>